Welcome to 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent, and in this episode, I'm going to try and take care of some odds and ends, get the wheels on there, hopefully convert to a rear disc brake, and get the RC1 into my scooter. I want to install the carb and the air filter onto the engine, but before I install the carburetor, I'd like to give it a quick cleaning. So this is a new carburetor, it's never been used, but even with new carburetors, I do like to take them apart. It's a good time to take an inventory of what's in there, write down things like your main jet size and needle jets and so on. Also, before I start, I'll always turn the screws here in, count how many turns it takes to turn them in, that way I know exactly where to put them back. Um, but you never know if there could be any kind of debris or something left over from manufacturing and it's just not a bad idea. So I'm going to start by just removing the top. I've never worked with a VHS T car before so this is a bit different for me. It looks like sort of a flat slide and sort of a round slide. Basically like a flat slide car but got nice rounded edges so it's a long oval and the other thing that's a little different for me is they've got a hex in there to secure the needle so normally I'm used to just stuff that goes under a spring different little clips and stuff got a little spring in there and everything looks like a very nice way to retain the needle and so the needle has a washer on here as well as the standard clip. So if you take this thing apart, make sure you don't lose this little washer. I'll take note of two things. First, you should see a number usually right below the needle grooves here. In this case, it says D41. The other one is if you look at the clip positions on here, this is in the second position. So normally they're numbered from top to bottom, so this would be one, two, three, four, it's in position two. I also went ahead and measured this little washer that was underneath of the needle, and that's 0.5 millimeters. So I'm just gonna write that stuff down, and now I know it for future reference. For me, it makes the process easier if I can keep small assemblies like this all together. So what I'm gonna do before I go any further is clean this off. I'm just gonna spray everything with a little bit of card cleaner. Everything appears to be clean. I don't see any potential issues here, any burrs or anything like that. So just going to spray it off. I'll let this dry for a minute and then I'll go ahead and reassemble. Starting with my little washer here that I know needs to go underneath of the clip on the needle. And the needle can drop down into the slide. Making sure I've still got the spring on the bottom of here. I can go ahead and install this and tighten it down a little bit which is basically just going to be snug. I'll also clean the spring real quick. And in this case, they use a little brass piece that I have to remember is in the bottom of the spring. And I'll take a look at the cap. Now, even though this should be fine with carb cleaner, especially being a cap that's on a carburetor, it should be designed to be around fuel and such. I still don't like to spray it if I don't have to and the rubber o-ring I don't want to spray if I don't have to but I've got a few specks on here looks like aluminum chunks so I am gonna make sure I wipe that off and I've just got a little bit of simple green on a clean paper towel so I'll just wipe the area and get that stuff out of there now back to the main body of the carb I've got two screws here on the side so this is going to be the idle speed setting first off I'm gonna Screw this in and count how many turns it takes to screw it in until lightly seated. So that's a half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, and... Basically five turns. So I'm going to write down idle speed screw five turns out. I'm going to do the same thing here for the mixture screw. That one is almost exactly four turns out. Now I can remove both of these. 
Whenever you remove these, there are springs and washers and seats, uh, rubber seals under some of them, so just be careful, don't lose anything. So there's my screw, and you can see I've got a rubber o-ring on there. That one is uh, designed with a groove, so it's not really going anywhere. And nothing else underneath of that one. So there's the screw itself, and then there's some stuff in there. We've got a spring. I was expecting to have a rubber seal of some sort in there, but nothing came out. And it doesn't look like anything else that can come out of there. I'm going to go ahead and pop off this hose here. It's just connecting the uh, vent areas. It's basically just a vent hose. And flip my choke up. One screw here. And then this should pull up and out. You want to be careful. Make sure you get the O-rings and anything else that will come out of there. In this case, everything stayed right on here. Next, I'll remove the bowl. So there's this nut on the bottom. This thing should serve two purposes. It secures the bowl, but it also is a main jet holder, which makes it really easy to swap main jets if you're tuning. And that's a 14 millimeter. So you can see the main jets in there. And you've got this, looks like a brass washer under there. Or no, never mind, that's cork or something, okay. Take note of the main jet, which is 150. This is another one of those small assemblies that it's easier for me to just keep together. So I'll spray both of these out with carb cleaner. Then I'm going to use compressed air and blow through the main jet. Pretty much anything with orifices, small holes. I like to give them a blast of compressed air. Also slide my gasket back on there so that's all ready to go when I'm ready to put the bowl back on later. Now the bowl should slide off of there, just straight down. I'm used to a float that is all one piece on here. So you've got the float arm, whatever it's called here, and then the float themselves, the floats, are attached to it. But this thing actually has these pegs inside of the bowl and the floats sit inside of there. So I'll go ahead and pop those out. O-ring looks good. So I'm just going to give the bowl a quick cleaning. I know I say I don't want to spray anything plastic if I don't have to, but carb cleaner should be safe for this stuff and these are designed to sit in the gas tank or in the bowl and inside of fuel, so they should be just fine. And I'm going to set those back into position which you can see you can't really get it wrong because if you try to put it in the wrong way that thing's going to get in the way so you know you've got to turn it this way i'll start up here this should be the starter jet also going to take note of this this is a 60 starter jet now there's a pilot jet or slow jet up here i'm going to remove that Okay, so that is a 33 pilot jet or slow jet. Same treatment. And then down inside of there, you can see it looks almost like another jet, but that should be the atomizer. Just like on the jets, if you look up here, you should see some numbers. So this is 271HH. Treat this just like a jet. It's got little tiny orifices on the side. So make sure you get all those cleaned out. And then the last thing I'm going to remove is I'm going to take off this float arm here and get the needle out. And I just want to make sure that everything's clean in there. We've got one open end of this pin that goes through there. So you should be able to just grab that with a pair of pliers and pull it out. And then you can pull up this arm and the float needle should be hanging from it. Go ahead and quickly clean these one piece at a time. Float needle will have a rubber tip on there, a rubber coated tip, so just make sure that that's not scratched up or damaged in any way. And then the needle seat, this is a 9mm. You'll see there's also a little gasket up in there, so don't lose that. 
The only reason I'm really taking this out is because I'm going to spray the carb and I want to make sure I don't lose this when I spray the carb. This is 320. That's as far as I'm going to strip this down. So there's other stuff you could try to get out of there, but at this point, I don't really see the need for it. So I just want to go through the carburetor body. First off, look for anything damaged, rough, etc. And then go through and blow out all of these passages with both carb cleaner and compressed air. And everything. Passages you'll see up here, inside the carb, anywhere you can find. And I'm just going to generally clean it. Spray the whole thing down. Now I just need to start putting this back together the way it came apart. So I'll start off here with the needle seat. Remembering I had this little gasket in there. So I'm going to drop the gasket down inside. And then I can screw this on. And all the card parts are just kind of snug. Uh, you're talking about aluminum and brass and delicate parts. So these are not the kind of things that you really put a lot of torque on. My atomizer. Pilot jet. Starter jet. Now the float arm and the float needle. The float needle will just hang on the float arm like that. So when you drop this in place, make sure that you're putting the needle into the seat down there. Get the pin. And once everything's aligned, you can push that pin through. And I'll just make sure that it's actually pushed in there well. And verify that everything is working and moving smoothly. That should wrap up the bowl area. So I'm going to take the carb and insert it into the rest of the bowl. And you should be fine. There's not really a whole lot to look out for with this sort of float because these arms basically interact with these pieces on the float. And if the float floats up, it will go ahead and push those arms. But there's nothing you have to connect there. Just make sure that it's going down in the centers basically all. Push that on. And I've got my main jet and holder. And I've got my gasket on there. Back to the top. Pick this up. And then drop this into there. And I can install the screw for that. Now I can install the idle speed screw. And this is where my notes from earlier come in handy. So I'm going to screw this all the way down until it's lightly seated. Which is there. And I had noted that it was five turns out, so I will just turn this five turns out. Same process for the mixture screw. And there actually is an o-ring in there that I missed. Luckily I didn't blow that thing out of there. I thought there should be, but I couldn't see it in there. It's not an o-ring, it's actually a washer, but I'm trying to make sure that's seated or get it out of there. There we go. I guess it is an o-ring. So I'm going to take that and slide that over my jet here, or my screw, excuse me, and then screw this in. Again, lightly seated, and then I'll back it out the number of turns that I noted before. Then I've got this connector here for the vents. I'm not sure if it'll rest better if I put it on the opposite way. Let's see. There we go. And then I can finish off with the slide and the needle assembly. And you want to make sure you're installing this the right way. There should only be one way that it's really going to go in. There's a little ledge here on this wall. And then you can see there's a ledge on the slide itself. So both of these will face the mouth of the carb. So obviously this one has to face the mouth of the carb, but also when your slide goes in, this will face the mouth of the carb. And you may just have to wiggle this around and try to get it so that the needle's actually going into the bushing there. There we go. 
That slid all the way down. Now the spring, remember we've got this brass piece that's going to face down. The cap can go on there, just align the spring with the center of the cap. And that should complete the carb cleaning. And I know some people are going to say that's a total waste of time, but realistically, this will probably take you 15 to 20 minutes being careful about it. And now you know exactly what's in your carburetor, what the initial settings were, and you're sure that there's no debris in there. Now I'll go ahead and put this in my intake. I've got this about as loose as I can get this clamp without it actually coming apart or anything. It's going to take some pressure, I imagine. Well, not awful. I've certainly dealt with worse. Although it doesn't want to seat all the way. There it goes. I think, yeah. Next up is the air filter, and this is a two-piece air filter. So first off, just look inside the air filter and make sure there's nothing in there. Make sure this is all clean. Same for this, just clean it off if need be. This piece is kind of neat. I haven't seen anything quite like it with carburetors that I've used. So when I first looked at the carburetor, I thought that is an awfully sharp edge. And I was thinking about taking this edge off, um, just giving it a little bit of a chamfer there. So it's at least not incredibly sharp. But when I checked out the air filter, it's got a ledge in there. This will go inside the air filter or on the carb, whichever way you want to install it. And once that's on there, it actually creates a nice smooth transition into the carb. I think for me it's going to be easier to take this off and put this piece inside of the air filter first. This piece is also necessary because this air filter is way too big for the carburetor otherwise. Now that this is flush, I can go ahead and put this in place. I'm going to install the engine mount tube. And this is not included from Melosi, so you can either take the one out of the engine that was in your scooter or buy a new one, it's up to you. When it's installed, at least in my case, the ends are different lengths. So if you look at the clip grooves there, different distances from clip groove to end, I know that this side has to be on the stator side for it to properly fit in my scooter. Once it's installed just a little bit, you need to install one snap ring. And the reason is, this thing is so tight, so close to these bolts, that it actually won't clear these with just a snap ring on there. So I'm going to install the first snap ring, slide that into place, and then I'll continue pushing this through. And I'll have to keep moving this back. This is going to be the snap ring for the furthest groove on here. So I'll move this back more, keep sliding this through. And now that I've cleared the second bolt here on this side, I'm going to take the other snap ring and put that into place. Then I'll keep sliding a little bit and keep moving the snap ring. And I'll push this the rest of the way in. So the snap ring should be right up against the bearing over here. And then this snap ring will also need to be moved over, get that into its groove, which should be again right up against the bearing on that side. You may need to get in there with a screwdriver just to push it the rest of the way. Make sure you can't pull this out, it shouldn't be able to move back and forth. I'm going to install the wheel hub or adapter and the brake next, but this is a Moto Force wheel adapter or hub and it's got some pretty rough casting here on the outside, parting marks. So there's really no reason that I need to do this other than, I guess, because I can just for fun. But I'm going to put it in the lathe. I'm going to try to make sure it's nice and straight because this will be rotating at whatever speed the wheel is going. And I'm going to just try to machine this outside edge. Didn't worry about polishing, just gave it a nice machined kind of brushed finish, nice smooth edges.
This is not included with Molosi's RC1 or C1 kit, so you will need your own adapter. So now I'm getting ready to install my brake onto the adapter. The brake rotor also is not included. This is for a Yamaha Aerox, same as this is, or MBK Nitro. There's two sides of this. The back side, you'll see it has this lip. That's the one that's going to go up against the case, and this is also where the brake rotor needs to be installed. So after the brake rotor is cleaned with brake parts cleaner, you can drop it into place on there. It's got these little things that help align it, and then just align the holes. The brake bolts seem kind of hard to find to me here in the U.S. Luckily, ScooterTuning.ca had these in stock, but these are M10 by 1.25 by 15. And M10 by 1.25 is just a difficult size. There's not a whole lot of brakes that use those. But the good thing about these, these are from Motoforce and they have the uh, thread locker already installed. So you can go ahead and thread these in. I'll torque these to 23 Newton meters because these are all Yamaha Aerox parts and that's the spec out of a Yamaha Aerox service manual. And I've got this just supported in my vise with soft jaws. You may be able to just hold the rotor, but to me this is easier. I've got the engine raised up slightly on a block of wood, so I've got clearance for my rotor. And this will slide on this way with a disc up against the engine. And you'll just have to align the splines there. To secure this, I'm using two more parts that aren't included in the kit. And that's a washer and the wheel nut or the hub nut. And these are actually a wheel washer and a wheel nut from a Yamaha Zuma 50. Uh, I can get those in the U.S. from Yamaha parts dealers. So this will just go on first, the washer, and then the nut can be installed. This should be torqued to 120 Newton meters. Since this is a substantial amount of torque, I'm putting my spanner in place here. And I'm going to try to let it hold for me instead of me having to try and hold the brake still or the hub still. Next up is the caliper. This is a Yamaha Aerox rear brake caliper. I picked it up from ScooterTuning.ca. Pads and everything included. You will want to make sure you spray this off with brake cleaner to be sure it's clean. Then, that's not included with the kit, by the way, with Melosi's kit. Also not included are the bolts for the caliper. These are M8 by 1.25 by 25. I'm going to make sure the pads are spread apart, and then I'll put this over top of the brake disc. It's going to slide between the pads. These mounting tabs should face the engine. For me, there's just no way that this is going to fit without some sort of spacer before the hub and the brake assembly here goes on because the brake itself, the disc, is pushing right up against one side of the caliper. So, let's see, it's pushing right up against this side of the caliper or the brake pad in there and it's jammed up against that and there's still not enough clearance for me to get the caliper in there so it has to be moved out and I was curious if this is just me and my parts choice or what the case is so I looked first in an Aerox service manual and I don't see them listing any spacers in there so then I contacted Ryan Ott because he's got the same setup in his Zuma and he says he's sure that he had to use spacers in there and he also said sometimes there can be a problem where uh, it looks like this is going to hit the wheel. He said it's always very close. So the other thing he pointed out to me is he had posted in the past pictures of different hubs and apparently depending on the exact hub that you get they can be designed a little bit different so there can be different kinds of spacing issues depending on the actual hub. So there's Yamaha hubs and CPI hubs and this is a Motoforce hub so I guess this is going to vary for everyone so I apparently before I put this together and torqued it down, I should have checked everything then, but I thought because I had looked at the manual and looked at their diagrams that I was good to go with just the uh, spacer out here or the washer and the wheel nut. But I'm gonna have to take this stuff off and come up with a spacer that'll work. After going through what I had on hand, I found two washers that should work. Both of these were too small inside diameter, so I just stuck them in the lathe and opened them up. But between the two, they are about three and a half millimeters thick, and I think that should work for me. So I'm going to go ahead and put this stuff back together, retorque it, and then check again.
it looks much better now. So now when this is installed, the disc, instead of being all the way up against here on this side, it's now sitting a little bit off of that, more toward the center. And I actually have some wiggle room here. Before, it was basically just, uh, I would try to get it down there and then it wouldn't fit at all. But now, I can move it back and forth just a little bit. So that should be a good fit for me. And just in case you wanted to know, the washers in total ended up 17.5 ID, 25 OD would be about ideal, I think, and three to four millimeters of thickness. So now I'm gonna put this back in place, and then I'm gonna use a little bit of medium strength thread locker on each one of the bolts and get those started. Now I want to finish off by torquing these to 23 newton meters and I just realized that with my standard 3.8 stuff it's not going to fit because they give you no room in there. So I've had to piece this together using quarter inch and then a 3.8 adapter so it'll work with my uh, torque wrench but just be aware of that. Make sure this still rotates freely and then recheck your alignment of the disc and the pads. I guess I'm gonna do the mud guard next. I was trying to figure out if it was easier to put the mud guard on first or the wheel. I think the mud guard's gonna be easier first just because you have to get inside of here to put a couple of nuts on. So it's got one spot here that fits over this tab on the case. And then up front, it's got two tabs of its own that interact with these spots. So I'm just gonna roughly slide it in place and start getting all those things where they should be. I'm gonna get this over top of there. It can pretty much only fall into place one way up front. So this tab on the fender will be outside of this tab on the case. And over on this side, the tab on the fender has to be inside of the tab on the case. Melosi supplies the hardware and you'll find that you have different lengths of bolts. So the longest one should be 30 millimeter length is gonna go back here. And you'll notice there are two different mounting locations back here, so basically, it just depends how high you want the back of the fender. So if you use this one, the fender's gonna sit a little higher. I'm gonna use that one to give me a little extra clearance. So I'll just align that, and I'll put the bolt through there. And then a washer goes on there, as well as one of the flange nuts that they provide. And I'm just gonna get those started. I'm not gonna tighten them yet. There's a cutout on the back of this tab that is for this small nut in the Melosi kit. So you've gotta reach behind there and get this nut pushed into the back of this tab which may have been easier before I put the mud guard in place. There it goes. Then you can get the tab aligned and I'm gonna use the shortest of the bolts with one of the large washers. And you're probably gonna to have to hold on to the back of that to make sure that nut doesn't just pop out while you get it started. Then over on this side, you've got the only bolt that's left, which was the medium sized one. And then there's a very small nut and a smaller washer. So you're going to try to get the bolt started through here. And this is why you don't tighten anything up because this will take a little bit of maneuvering, especially since it runs right into the bottom of the carb. You may have to kind of move your carb out of the way. There it goes. And put the small washer on there and a small nut. For me, this nut will not thread onto this bolt, even if I put a wrench on there to hold it. Any healthy amount or reasonable amount of torque that I try to put on there is not going to work. I've got my own hardware that actually works on the bolt. It's got proper threads inside. I'm going to try to hold the washer and the nut on the inside here and then try to start the bolt through them because it's probably going to be hard to turn this nut from the limited clearance. So now I can just go around and snug all of these up. And I don't have a torque spec for those, but good and snug is fine. And you know, they say to put the washer actually on the inside of this, but it's got a flange nut. Yeah, see, there's the washer and the nut on the inside of this and just the bolt on the outside. But this makes no sense because it's got a flange nut over there and this is just trying to pull right through the plastic. So let me take this out and put it what should be the proper way, I think. Yeah. 
it's right up against this fender and I'm just expecting that that's going to rattle. So I'm going to see what happens if I just flip this upside down and if it gives it any more clearance. Okay, let's see what this does. Yeah, see this is upside down and now not a lot of clearance, but you do at least have a little bit of clearance there. It doesn't appear that this plastic is going to rattle on that. Of course, that's glued. I was going to say you might be able to take, take that cover off, but I think it's all glued into place or something. So probably not the best idea. Now I just need to rotate this uh, clamp around and tighten it up where I want it. Removing my little makeshift engine holder now, or engine stand, and then I'll see if I can get the wheel on there. Before I try to put the wheel up there, I wanted to mention that you also will need bolts, wheel bolts, and I'm going to use wheel washers, you don't necessarily have to. So I went with M10 by 1.5 by 50 uh, Allen head or socket cap screw bolts here. And you could use a little shorter, I think 45 millimeter may be the standard, but I went with 50 because I'm going to use washers under there. I figured for me with the powder coated wheels, maybe the washers will save a little bit of powder coat. So these are 20 millimeters OD, 10.5 ID, and 1.8 millimeter thick. And I got all this stuff from McMaster Car. When you look at the hub, you'll see that it has something similar to what it has for the brake disc. It's got these little nubs here, and those help to align it on center with the wheel. On the back side of the wheel, you've got a recess there. That's what's going to align with those nubs. So to make it easier on myself, what I'm going to do is arrange this. I'm going to go ahead and turn this hub so that I've got one bolt hole toward the top and two toward the bottom. Then when I go to put the wheel on, I'll do the same thing. I'll try to keep it so that I've got one bolt hole toward the top and two toward the bottom, and that'll just make it a little bit easier to align things. And it looks like I never checked when the powder coater did my wheels. Now I can't fit my bolts through my wheels. So I'm going to have to go ahead and take care of that real quick. If you've got one, then the finishing touch is one of these little plastic caps that goes in the center. So I don't know if they're supposed to push into place or not. Mine's not going to, at least with all this powder coating on there. So I'm going to see if I can just gently tap that into place. I'm pretty sure it's the powder coating doing this. So I'm just going to shave a little off because it's pretty thick in there. powder is on this thing. I've now got neon yellow dust on everything, but I think it's going to fit. That coating was way more substantial than I realized. I would say there was at least a sixteenth of an inch of coating that I removed. And there's still more that I could, but I was trying to leave some of it intact. Of course, when I did a quick, like just started to push it in there to see if it was okay, then it wanted to go in. Now that I'm going to tell you it should fit, it won't go in. Okay, that was really easy, just like everything else. First try, got it spot on. There's still a little bit to be done to the engine, not a whole lot. Obviously, I need the exhaust on there. I need a temperature sensor in the head and some small stuff like that. But before I do anything else, I want to get this in the scooter. And before I can put this in the scooter, I have to take my TPR86CC out of there. Looks like my camera ran out of space and I didn't even realize it so it shut off, but you get the idea, the engine's out. So before I move this engine off of the bench, I'm going to go ahead and remove this, which is the coolant temp sensor. 
and also the EGT probe out of the exhaust. I cleaned off the temp sensor and was preparing to install it in the cylinder head cover and realized it does not fit. So I was assuming that this was eighth inch NPT and that's what this is, but I was wrong on both accounts actually. So this is M10 by 1.0 and this is eighth inch BSP. So I looked around and Trailtech does not sell a M10 by 1.0 temp sensor and there aren't really many fitting options for these and the best thing that I could find is an M10 by 1.0 male to 8th inch BSP female adapter. Unfortunately it is now after 8 o'clock on Monday night and I want this thing running and tuned if at all possible by Thursday night at the latest so I can be ready for the car show on Friday. So I've ordered an adapter uh, with express shipping. But right now I'm just going to tape back over this just to keep any debris out of there while I work on other stuff. I'm going to start working on getting the rear brake set up. So first I got to remove this little rubber cap that's on here. I'm going to make sure my M10 banjo bolt does indeed fit in here. It should, but I want to check before I even start. Which it does. The brake hose that I have is from an Eton or Eaton scooter, I think. Could have been something else, but I believe it was a scooter with a rear disc brake. And pretty much I just measured from where I thought the rear brake would be around the frame of the scooter and up to where the rear brake lever would be and went a couple inches longer than that put that in and this is what came up but i think this should work I've got two different angled ends on here so i need to figure out which one works best for this scenario in the rear uh, because i don't want this running into the wheel obviously that would not be good and that one comes pretty straight over there so that should work fine. Let's check the other one. This fitting also looks like it would work pretty well. This looks more like what they'd probably intend for the rear. The other one looks like what they'd probably want on the front. So let me just go and I'll check the front and I'll see how that looks to make sure. Here's the master cylinder and lever that I got. And this came in a pair, so I've got one for the other side. Don't know if I'll put that on right away. Depends on how time goes before the car show but seems like a pretty decent looking setup. We'll see how it actually performs. Hopefully it's not junk. For now, I just want to get this mounted to the bars. I don't have clearance for this to go on while this is here, which I really hate to just chop that off in case I need it. If you ever get cheap levers like this, I would suggest checking them over because I just realized the bolt here that goes through the adjuster, that thing is really loose. I can turn it by hand. And then back here, the one that is actually holding the whole lever assembly on, that one's sticking up a couple millimeters above there because it's not tight. Now back to what I was originally trying to do, which was to see which one of these ends of the hose would work best up here. I think it's probably gonna be this one. Except I think maybe I'd actually wanna do it the other way. I don't really want this angled at my bars. Not really sure. I don't like it going that way. I guess this could just come down like that. And let me try the other one just in case. Definitely not that way. That could work, but I don't like it that much. So yeah, I think this curved end is the way to go. And for me, it's going to face forward. So you should have the bolt with one banjo washer Put that through 
And then if I can get it turned around, put another one on that side. So basically you're gonna sandwich this banjo fitting in between the master cylinder here and the bolt. Since this is where I expect to be able to keep this, now I need to work on routing this all the way down to the back of the scooter. Luckily for me, I don't really have many body panels to deal with, so it's not terribly complicated usually. The main thing is make sure it's in safe locations at all times. Don't run it near uh, anything moving that can pinch it and all that kind of stuff. And you also want to make sure if you're tying this stuff down, I wouldn't suggest tying it down too much or tightly until you've got it all the way routed, but you want to make sure around the handlebars that when you tie this down somewhere, you give it enough room. I can't turn my wheel because it's in a chalk, but give it enough room that when you do turn the wheel, you still got enough slack in there and it's not pulling on the hose. The rear connection will be just like the front where you should have your hose sandwiched between two of these banjo washers. Once it's snug, just rotate it around and see exactly where you want it. Don't get too close to the brake disc, don't get too close to the wheel, etc. So I think that looks pretty good for me. So now I'll just hold it in place while I tighten it the rest of the way. It's very important to secure the hose so that it cannot get into any moving parts. I was hoping that I had some metal versions of clamps like this around, but unfortunately I don't. And so what I've done is use some small clamps here and I've just used zip ties around these rubber grommets because these plastic ones, the larger ones that I had are so flimsy that they just want to come apart. But it's secure enough that I don't have to worry about it and it's also got a little bit of slack in there. So when this moves with a suspension, I won't have to worry about that. Now I'll make the connections for the brake switch, which on this one is very simple. They're just these quick disconnect style. And they are actually a little more narrow than this, but these will work. And what I do is I just pinch these a little bit with a pair of pliers. That way they have to go on really tight. And it does not matter which terminal you put which one on. This is a really simple just on off switch. I'm going to use a vacuum brake bleeder. You can do this the old fashioned way, just pumping the brake and opening the bleed valve, but I'm going to try the vacuum bleeder because this tends to make it a quick and easy process. I will put links in the description. I've got a video uh, when I did my T-Max service where I went into great detail about multiple different ways to bleed brakes. So if you need help bleeding brakes, you should check that out. I was going to move on to doing all the plumbing for the cooling system, so I replaced one hose that wouldn't quite reach because of the way this engine is set up, especially probably because of the angle it's at right now. And then I was going to try and figure out where my water pump will be because I'm going to run an electric water pump. But I realized it'd probably be a better idea to have the exhaust in place first to make sure that I've got plenty of clearance wherever the water pump goes to do the exhaust. And I don't want to jump into the exhaust just yet. So I've been taking care of a few other things that I can tackle more quickly, small tasks. So took the spark plug out, put the uh, thermocouple under there for my cylinder head temperature. I'm getting ready to plumb the fuel in for the carb, which is really simple. Um, fuel connection is right here, and then it just goes to a filter into my tank. And I have at least figured out I shouldn't have to do anything or do much for the wiring of the water pump because I used to have an electric pump. For some reason I thought I'd unhooked all this stuff, but the relay and everything is still here and still working. I've got a connector here. I'm probably just gonna have to make up a new 
harness to go to the pump because this is not going to be long enough with what I've got on the pump for wherever it ends up. When you set the carb up and you're connecting your fuel hose, make sure it's a secure connection. And I like to just add on a little zip tie here. Sometimes they're really tight and I don't bother. This one's not super tight, so just a little extra insurance that this won't come off. Now I want to set up the throttle cable, so I'm going to remove both of the bolts in the top of the carb. And I can take that cap off, pull the spring out, and get in there and get the slide out as well. Now I'm feeding my throttle cable through the tube here, and I'm going to put the cap back on. I don't need the bolts or anything right now. And I just want to evaluate where everything is. So I want to make sure this is a safe location because if this won't work out, then I can swap this piece, this little adapter out on the top of the carb if need be. But I think maybe just turned a little to the side to give it a little extra clearance. I think this should be good. You got to understand that the scooter is going to move around because of your suspension. So make sure there's nothing that's really going to snag it um, and bend the cable too sharply. But in this case, I think this area will be just fine for me so I can go ahead and proceed. Now I need to add a little slack to my cable so it's easy to get the throttle slide all set up. So I've got an adjustable cable. I'm just going to loosen this stuff up and thread it this way. And this thing's really long because I had cut the uh, sheathing back a little bit for the Electron and that thing takes a lot of cable so I should have no trouble about here. Now I'll take the spring and slide the cable through the center of that remembering that this brass piece needs to face what will be down in the carburetor. And it's got a little perch kind of in the cap that that'll sit against. Then I can compress the spring when you look into the throttle valve, you'll see the brass piece in the center and there's a slot in that and then down at the bottom, there's a larger opening. So the barrel on the end of your carb cable, throttle cable, will need to go into that large opening down there and then just kind of slide over right through that uh, slit in the side of it. So right down through the slit and then get the barrel on the side and then you should be able to pull it up and it'll kind of hook in there and you can tell it's secure. Now I've got way too much slack in the cable so I'm going to go back to my adjuster and tighten that up until the spring is at least sitting up against the cap there. Now I'm going to reinstall this and there is a ledge here that will need to face back so face this ledge toward the wheel. And then slide that in and make sure it goes all the way down. There it goes. Then go ahead and reinstall the screws and snug this down. Now I'm going to loosen the clamp and remove my air filter because I want to be able to look into the carburetor. Now you can take most of the slack out of the throttle cable, leave just a tiny bit in there, and then you can look into the carb. You should see that the throttle slide is able to sit down at the bottom up against the idle speed screw here on the side. So it's not going to look totally closed. It'll probably look something like this. The cable should pull the throttle valve all the way up out of the way of the Venturi. But in my case, it's not happening because there's too much slack that I can't take out of this cable. So I'm going to have to replace this cable. You also want to make sure it returns easily. So you can see mine's not. Again, I've got way too much slack in my cable, so I'm probably going to have to swap mine out. I installed a new cable that I had here, and then I had the opposite problem, and I didn't have enough slack. So basically, I had zero slack in there, and I like to have at least a little bit. So I looked around through the stuff I had, and I found this was the original piece that came out of the top here. And these just thread into the top. You can screw those in and out. So I had a piece similar to that but at a slightly different angle. And actually, the way this angles up is a little better for my setup anyway. And this was longer than it is now, but I cut it down a bit, and I also cut this piece in here that's an adjuster down a bit. So this is the adjuster that came out of here. I didn't show you earlier, but basically this piece just threads into the end, and then you can thread it out and lock it down with this nut to take out slack. 
but I cut this all down because I don't need any slack here. I've got all my adjustments on my cable all the way for the longest length of cable I can have exposed as possible, so I really don't need more adjusters. And just that little bit of change is probably a quarter to a half inch in total is enough for me. Here's a look inside the carb with a properly working setup. I've got a little bit of slack and then I can pull this all the way open. Everything in there clears. The throttle valve is all the way out of the way of the Venturi. And then when I release, it should quickly snap back. One more time. Much better now. I've done a couple more things that I want to show you. So I switched out the connector here on my water pump wiring because I had some uh, standard scooter connectors on there that aren't waterproof or sealed in any way. So I swapped back to a sealed connector. I was using the others because I had a PWM on there at one point trying to regulate a pump. And I also went and extended the wires on my water pump and got a matching connector on there. So whenever I uh, get the exhaust done, this will be ready to just plug in. Even though the engine is grounded by the way it's mounted in the frame, I always like to use an engine ground as well. And that goes right into the wiring harness. So I've always got my wiring harness, my engine, the frame, and the battery ground all tied together. I'm going to work on the exhaust next, but it won't just be a bolt-on. I want to install an EGT or an exhaust gas temperature sensor into my pipe. So I know that I need the EGT to be about 150 millimeters, which is around 5.9 inches from the piston skirt. So I've got to take a measurement from the flange up to the piston skirt of the cylinder. And then I need to measure how far I need to go into the exhaust. I'll have to look at the pipe on the scooter and figure out exactly where I want to install a bung. And I actually need to make a bung on the lathe. So I'm just gonna basically make up a small piece with an M5 by 0.8 thread in there because that's what my sensor is. And then I'll have to weld that in. So I wanna mention before I show any of this stuff that you need to be really careful when you do all this work to a pipe because you don't wanna introduce any chips or anything into the exhaust that'll probably get sucked into your engine. So that's why you'll be seeing a vacuum hooked up to the exhaust and taking some precautions to try and make sure I get all of the chips out of there. I have an entire video dedicated to EGT installation on two strokes. So if you want any details about the stuff you're about to see, please go check that out. I will put a link in the description. This Melosi exhaust is incredibly tight. So I can get this up there about maybe one or two millimeters, and then it is a dead stop. I mean, it is not going on. Now, I'm not hammering it with this, I'm giving it light taps, but there's no amount of pressure that I can put on here and rotating and such that will make this go any further. And my other exhaust on the TPR was kind of tight, but I could get it up there. This thing just isn't happening. So I'm gonna go and sand some of the coating off. The coating that they put on the outside of this also ends up on the inside here. I'm gonna sand the inside of the header here a little bit and see if maybe that helps. Notice that I'm trying to keep the header facing down so the stuff, any debris is more naturally gonna fall out. And I'm gonna clean it out after anyway but it doesn't hurt. And also this is just uh, 320 grit. Looking in there now after I've sanded a bit, you can see this is the actual metal of the exhaust, this color, and then up here the whiter stuff, that is from the coating. So I'm gonna continue to sand until I can get this coating off. And I'm not really worried about this because the coating on these pipes burns off anyway, especially what's up really, really close to the exhaust port. So that stuff is probably gonna be gone in very short order anyhow.
I'm also going to smear just a tiny bit of grease inside of here. Two stroke oil would also be acceptable. There we go. It's certainly still not going on there easy, but well, maybe not. I thought it was going to go up there. It went a couple of millimeters more than it did before. But I'm still five, six, seven millimeters short of where it actually should be because the O-ring is going to go up here. And for this thing to seal with the O-ring, it's got to be installed all the way up there. I'm just going to leave this for now. Maybe when I actually have to install it, I may try to heat this a little bit, not a whole lot, just see if that's enough to get it the rest of the way up there. But all I really want to do is install that exhaust bung. Right now I'm trying to figure out exactly where I want to place it. I certainly don't do pretty welds, but it's in there. And I went through with a tap after, used a vacuum, and cleaned everything up. Because it burned off all the coating in the area, I just wiped it down right around here with WD-40. Now I can finally start installing the exhaust. And the first step is going to be to get this bracket on here. So in order to bolt this on, with this case, they actually have cutouts behind each one of these spots here on the case. And you should have Two nuts, they're M8 by 1.25, supplied by Melosi. I can't remember if they came with the exhaust or the case, but you need to put those in the back. And the top one may be a little bit of fun with the uh, carbon fender in place, but you need to get those situated in the back there. My hands definitely don't fit in here very well to reach the top mount now that the carbon wheel and everything is on, but I came up with something that seems to work. So I've got a long M8 by 1.25 bolt, and I've got the nut just started on there a little bit, very little, but it's enough that it holds it in place. You should be able to see the light shining through on the other side of the carburetor right where my finger is pointing. That is where the hex spot is in the case. So you can get kind of a straight shot from over here if you've got a long bolt like this, and then just work that over, get it in position. You can pick the carb up a little bit and then get it in that spot. Okay, you can see I've got the nut into the slot now. It's on the end of the bolt. So now I'm just gonna unthread the bolt and that will come out of the nut. I'll push the nut all the way back and then remove my bolt. You'll have to be careful not to push those out when it's time to install the bolts. So when the bolts are going in, you're gonna have to get your finger behind there or something just to make sure that they don't pop out the back. The bracket is made so that it needs a spacer up top. You can see that just holding against the lower mount. It's sticking out from here and they did include a spacer so that will go between the spacer and the engine up top. And then you get two bolts, both with tapered heads to be countersunk, but one's longer than the other. The long one is going to go up top through the spacer, so of course the short one through the bottom. And I'm going to use a little bit of medium strength thread locker. Well, maybe I shouldn't have put the thread locker on there yet because it turns out that these don't align for me. My top bolt is still loose, so there's wiggle room here. And even at that, this is as close as I can really get it to fitting. So that's a pretty big mismatch here. So I'm gonna have to take the bracket off and then I'm gonna have to open this up a little bit on the bottom so I can actually get the bolt in there. And then because it's countersunk, it probably won't fit properly. Actually, I think I'm gonna change that plan a little bit what I'm going to do is drill each one of these with the next largest size of bit that fits and then see if they'll fit that way and then try with the next one up because I'm hoping maybe I can keep them centered within the uh, countersink area there and I won't have problems with the bolts going in and seating properly. Yeah. 
All right, let's try this again. And these will get torqued to 22 to 24 Newton meters. Or not. Melosi's high quality bolt is stripping before the torque spec. And I had it set on 23 right in the center. So whatever that is is gonna be good enough. I installed the flange when I did the cylinder, but I did not install this O-ring that goes on the exhaust here. So I'm gonna put a little tiny bit of grease on there and then I'm gonna slide that onto the flange until I get it in the groove. Now I'm gonna to try to get the body of the exhaust on. So I've got two springs handy that will go between the little perches here, the hooks here, and spots on the header flange. And I'm gonna to try to just push this up there because I checked it after I welded this bung on and for some reason it went on easier um, and the pipe was cool by then so it wasn't the heat so we'll see if it goes on easier this time. You need to get it pushed up until the top of the pipe here just passes the O-ring and then there's a little seat in there that's gonna stop it from going any further. I'll hook one end of the spring into the flange and then these spring puller tools come in really handy for this stuff. That's why they call them spring puller tools, who would've known? Just pull this down and it will take a considerable amount of force and get it to hook into one of the hooks in the pipe and then same deal on the other side. Next up is the silencer and in the end of the silencer there is an o-ring right in there so I have lightly greased that already. Then you should have a clamp in the kit and it's covered with this protective covering. So I'm going to go ahead and peel that off and then put this around the silencer and the silencer will just slide onto the stinger it will take a bit of pressure here eventually you should feel it stop there it goes and then you can kind of rotate this whatever way you like it most likely you're going to want melosi probably facing out and either want the tip of this facing down or outward a bit up to you. There's a spring to hold the silencer as well. So I'm going to hook that through the silencer and then pull it back to here. To finish the exhaust installation, you should have one bolt left and a washer that's going to go over that. That's going to have to go through both parts of this uh, clamp for the silencer. Then there's a spacer that will go behind that. And then behind that is the exhaust on the body of the exhaust. They've got a tab welded on there with a hole in it. And then if you align it properly, there's a bushing in the center of the back of this bracket and it's going to go through there. And then a nut will have to be used on the side of that to uh, secure it. So let's see if we can get this stuff going. Let's start off with the bracket or the clamp here and the spacer. And then I'm gonna have to raise my exhaust a little bit to align this stuff. Push that through. I'm gonna put a little bit of medium strength thread locker inside of the flange nut. And I'm gonna see if I can get back there to hold that in place and get the bolt started through it. After you've got it started, then you can use a 12 millimeter wrench, hold that in place and then tighten it up. That completes the exhaust installation. So now mostly I have to worry about the cooling system unless there's something I'm forgetting, which I'm sure there's something, but I need to get my pump set up, attached here somehow, get all the hoses ran. The only hose routed so far is the one to the top here to the cylinder head. And I've also got to install my sensor over here, hopefully. Oh yeah, I was definitely forgetting something. There's a hole in the side of the exhaust here where an EGT sensor is supposed to go. So I'm going to take just a tiny bit of anti-seize 
put that low on the threads. I don't want it on the sensor part itself. And then I can thread that in there. I literally just got these fittings in from Express Mail and they are supposed to adapt M10 by 1.0 here on the male side to 8th inch BSP on the female side. So this should be the same thread as my cylinder head cover and this should be the same as my gauge or uh, my sender. I'm going to do a little preliminary fit just to make sure before I get this in the head. Well, and there's a problem already. So the hole going through there is not large enough for this to go through. So I'm going to stick this thing in the lathe and bore that out until it's large enough for this. This fits now, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap the sensor with some Teflon tape and then I'll install the sensor into the fitting and then I'm going to use an aluminum washer because these are straight threads not tapered and then install the whole assembly into the head. I want to get my Bosch electric water pump installed next and I've seen other people that basically just use the hoses to support the water pump. It wouldn't be my first choice but I'm not exactly sure where a bracket's going to fit out here so I think I'm going to give that a shot first. So I've got a short piece of hose on here that's going to connect there and then I need to replace this hose that goes into the radiator with a new hose that's going to run straight into this. It's certainly not rigid, but I don't think it's going anywhere either. Again, I've seen other people use them this way, so hopefully it'll work for me, at least for a little while. I don't like it being this close to the spinning rotor, especially when I get the wires up here. So I'm gonna go ahead and install Melosi's side cover. That's got four of these M5 bolts, and I'm just gonna snug them up and use a little medium strength thread locker. Not a lot of clearance there. I guess that's why everybody keeps those nuts so thin. I was trying to keep this a little thicker so it had more room to bite, but maybe a millimeter or two less would have been better. But for now, I'm gonna see if it works or not. I think I have everything ready to try to start this right now. I can't fit the seat yet. I'm going to have to work on that because uh, I've got the connectors too jumbled up on one side. I'm not sure if the carburetor will fit under the seat without some effort. Um, but otherwise, I believe it's at least ready to try to fire it up. So I'm going to get this thing off the bench and see what happens.
fired up pretty easy and I didn't notice anything obviously wrong aside from what you're seeing here which is the puddle of fuel below it. So this is kind of what I was afraid of with these carburetors that are angled up too much. So I guess I get to go in there and mess with Floatite. Alright, let's pop this bowl off of here and see if I can't lower the Floatite a little bit. I was hoping they already knew this thing would be at a ridiculous angle and the float height was set accordingly, but I guess not. These little tabs on the floats interact with these tabs on the float arm. And what you want to do, so it's going to sit like this. When it's totally empty, it'll be up here like that. And then as it fills, it'll rise. And when it rises enough, then it will stop off fuel by pushing the needle in there. So what we need to do is make it stop a little sooner. And to do that, we need these tangs here to be further up this way. Basically, we got to bend them up. So it should take very little effort. That's probably way too much. I'm just going to bend both of them up a bit. Trying to make sure they're both level just looking across. I'll put my float back in here. And I'll go see if this is good enough once I get it back together. The carb is just pushed into the intake right now. I don't have it secured with a clamp or anything. I've got the fuel hose attached again and that's it. There's no point of attaching everything to it and going to all that trouble because all I need to do is turn my fuel supply on and see if it's still leaking fuel. And right now it looks okay. I'm just going to give it probably five minutes to sit there and make sure it's not leaking. As long as it doesn't leak anything with the fuel supply turned on, then I'll go ahead and put it all back together. I actually gave it probably 15 or 20 minutes to sit there while I moved some wires around to get my seat bucket to fit. And it looks like at least without me on it, it fits fine with the seat bucket in there. Now this one's all cut out as you can see because I had the big electron carb in there and it needed tons of clearance, but I'm thinking I can probably swap one in that's not so beat up as long as this still works when I sit down on it and the angles change. I think it might actually be all right, so I'm gonna go grab a helmet and a GoPro and maybe get on this thing for a minute. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. My top speed was 46.2 at 13,600 RPM. I never really got into it hard and it still feels like a monster. I don't know that it really pulls that hard up top. I'm not sure, but the torque and the way it snatches when you go to take off is definitely a whole different level compared to what I'm used to. I thought the TPR was pretty quick and it's not a bad setup at all, but this thing is definitely nasty. Clearly, I don't have the fastest scooter in the world, but you feel like it when you first get on this thing. I'm sure I'll get used to it, but it's a lot. I think it's going to be fun to play with, although I don't recommend you play with scooters. It's very serious, stay safe, etc. But yeah, I think this thing is going to be a blast. And on to the sensible side of things, um, I'm just wiping the pipe down with some WD-40 right now, trying to make sure I keep rust off of it. Same thing I do with my exhaust on the uh, TPR, the Melosi exhaust. Um, but yeah, on the more serious side of things, when I did happen to pay attention to the uh, gauges, uh, EGT looked really good at part throttle. Most of the time it was, uh, I think max I saw at part throttle was around 900, though I was staying really, really low throttle all the time. Uh, I didn't pay attention when I rolled into it harder, to be honest with you. I was more just hanging on and kind of 
surprised by it, uh, but as of now, I would say, I mean, I could ride this thing around out of the box if the float height had been good. I could just go out there and cruise around right now and be very, very happy with it. I was just going to leave the front wheel on for now, but I was thinking it may not be that tough just to swap the wheel out and the brake onto the other wheel. Um, and then I may just leave the brake lever alone and not worry about doing that just yet. If you're wondering why you're seeing the brake rotor loose, that is because with the larger brake upgrade in the front, I can't fit the caliper off of the wheel or the wheel off the caliper unless this brake disc is loose. I'm hoping maybe that'll change with the Aerox wheel since this is a 12 and that's a 13. Maybe I can actually do like a brake service without having to loosen up the uh, rotor. I could just check the caliper or whatever or just take my wheel off without having to loosen the brake disc. Before I bother trying to swap any brake stuff, I'm just going to see if the wheel actually fits because I don't know. It could be uh, wider and more narrow or something. It could be an issue otherwise. So I just want to see if this thing even fits in here. Yeah, got the bearing and everything out of there. It looks like I should have just left this alone because I went to put the axle in. I gave it a tap and I guess there was a misalignment of the piece inside and it knocked this bearing out. Now. I thought this may have been a little loose when I first installed it, but it went in there what I thought was probably snug enough. And I was kind of worried because my powder coater, uh, I think sometimes they can be aggressive with the sandblasting and they sandblasted where the bearing sits, which is a horrible thing to do and I don't know why they would have done that. I think the powder coater has messed up my wheel. So they melted one set of wheels, give them a second, and then they sandblast where the bearing sit and now here we are. So I may be able to save this with either shimming or some retaining compound. I don't want to deal with that right now. That's a lot to deal with. Plus the spacing is going to be wrong. So I'm going to have to make spacers and that's way too much because it's now middle of the day Thursday. So not going to happen. I'm just going to put it back together with the wheel that I had on there. And I'll worry about that one later. Since it's here, I figured I might as well clean it while it's easy. I got the front wheel back on. I checked the coolant level to make sure it was still good. Went over some bolts, all those were still tight. Generally just looked the scooter over to make sure I didn't see any leaks or anything. And I reinstalled or I installed a stock seat bucket. So it looks like it should be fine with the stock seat bucket without anything cut out in the bottom of it. But I want to take it down the road to be sure of that. And I also want to try to run it wide open throttle long enough to see if the EGT looks safe. I'm not really worried about dialing it in. Uh, it's got plenty of power right now to do what I want to do at the car show, but I at least want to make sure it looks safe if I am on it wide open throttle. The seat bucket worked okay, but clearly it was not working at half throttle at least or above. So I think I've got the float height set too low now. And also when I came back I saw there's some gas laying down here and around here. It appears to be coming from the hose, the fuel connection to the carb. So I've got quarter inch on there and it's a little loose and I'm going to have to switch that up to 3 16 for a real tight fit and see if that will eliminate it. Float height seems close enough to me. I just ran it up from about 25-30 to 66 miles per hour and I won't hold it any longer than that at the beach for sure. So 
at least for now it's fine. EGT was a little over 1200 when I let off, so that's good. If anything, I'd say maybe it was a little rich up there, but that's fine with me. Um, then I went to wipe it down thinking I was done with it, and I've got marks on the high points of my wheels here, and realized that now, or maybe always, it's just barely rubbing the inside of the exhaust. So I'm going to remove the bolt from here, and I'm going to have to put a washer between the exhaust pipe and the bracket there, the bushing, just to move it out a little bit, maybe an eighth inch or so. That's better. Hopefully I've found the last of any major issues that I need to address before I actually take it out to the car show. I'll finish cleaning the wheels and see if I notice anything else along the way, but I believe it's about ready. Um, I think in the future it could probably use a little bit heavier slider weights or roller weights. Um, it's currently four grams, so maybe up to a quarter gram more if I had to guess. Um, and the main jet, possibly the float height, may need some more tuning. I've just left the 150 main jet in there and it's been good. So overall, I mean, this carb came out of the box pretty good. Mainly it was the float height issue for me where it was leaking at first and then I adjusted a little too much. Uh, but if they had got that right, this thing would be almost good to go just coming out of the package, which is pretty impressive. Um, and the whole package actually does pretty well for just putting it together. Sometimes you get a lot of stuff that pops up when you do sort of shakedown runs, uh, your first rides on it. And this has been mostly minor issues. So as much as I've complained about some of the things like the exhaust fitment and things like that, overall it is a pretty well designed package and obviously it makes a good bit of horsepower. So can't complain too much about it. With that said, make sure you stay tuned. So hit the subscribe button um, so you can see when I go to the car show, most likely later trying to dial it in a little bit better on the tune and whatever else is in store for me in the RC1. Also, give the video a like and share it if you enjoyed it. And thank you for watching.